Good to have you with us on this Sunday evening in Seoul. I'm Paul Yi, here to provide you the latest news stories from Korea and the world. Let's begin with the latest on the inter-Korean issue. South Korea will consider lifting a set of sanctions on the North, but only if Pyongyang agrees to resume long-stalled inter-Korean talks. The South's Ministry of Unification said Sunday that Seoul will continue to seek inter-Korean exchanges and cooperation, but will keep the sanctions in place. The statement was made on the fifth anniversary of the sanctions Seoul imposed on Pyongyang after it torpedoed the South Korean Navy corvette Cheonan, killing 46 sailors. The North wants the sanctions to be lifted before dialogue can take place, but Seoul maintains that Pyongyang should first take responsible action for the attack. North Korea responded by repeating its demand for an inter-Korean investigation into the sinking in return for abolishing the sanctions. It's been more than 60 years since the 1953 armistice was signed, ending the Korean War conflict. However, South and North Korea are still technically at war. On Sunday, a group of 30 women from 15 countries sought to call attention to the situation by crossing the heavily fortified border between the two Koreas on a mission of peace and reconciliation. Connie Kim reports. It was a peaceful crossing and a journey they once thought impossible. The so-called Women Cross DMZ group, which includes Gloria Steinem and two Nobel Peace laureates, marched from Kaesong in the north along the Gyeonggi Line and through the demilitarized zone on Sunday. This has been an incredible journey for me as an African and a survivor of war. We came personally, came to North Korea with one-way ticket from Beijing. We are going through Seoul because we didn't think it was going to be possible to cross the DMZ. We've done it. The group set off from China on Tuesday and made their way to North Korea. Speaking about their stay in the North, they said their biggest achievement was citizen-to-citizen -citizen diplomacy, communicating with North Korean women and observing their lives. One of the great triumphs of our collective effort here is that we made a statement of purpose and we were told that if we put in human rights, that it would not be approved by the North Korean group. We put in human rights, and it was approved by the North Korean group. And I think that was an enormous, enormous triumph. But the effort didn't come without some controversy. The group was accused of having a pro-North Korea stance after North Korea's official Dodong Shimun newspaper reported that the group's organizer, Christine Ahn, had praised Kim Il-sung at his birthplace. Ahn remained silent on the issue, while Steinem said the reports are absolutely not true. Undeterred by the reports and the scorching hot weather, the group resumed their peaceful march into South Korea. These hundreds of women walking towards the Imjinga Park have two goals, to bring attention to the forgotten war and to reunite families and the divided peninsula. Along the way, they sang songs about the unification of the two Koreas. When they arrived at their destination, they were greeted by hundreds of citizens and they read out a peace declaration confirming their resolve to end the war and bring together those who have been separated for so long. Connie Kim, Aidan News, Paju. And staying with North Korea, recent claims of progress on its nuclear and missile technology have been ratcheting up tensions on the peninsula. Our Hong Sung Yi sat down with Professor John Eikenberry of Princeton University for his views on the North's claims and how the international community should deal with the regime. What do you make of the recent claims by North Korea about progress in its nuclear program and its recent testing of the submarine-launched ballistic missile? I'm skeptical, uh, but they clearly are making progress. They've surprised uh, the world at how far they've come already. They've surprised the Chinese as well. So uh, I think... Uh, they're moving forward, uh, but maybe not quite as quickly as they claim. Secretary Kerry recently warned of more sanctions on North Korea. Do you think this is the right way to go in approaching North Korea at this point in time? Uh, you have to send a double message. One is that there is a, a, a huge price for what you're doing, uh, but there's also a huge prize, shall we say, for making the heroic steps to try to come back into the international community and, uh, and uh, make 
uh, the peninsula nuclear free. Do you see a need for China to play an even stronger role? They are clearly unhappy with North Korea. There's been a general, I'd say, movement across the, the last four or five years towards more aggravation, indeed quite uh, um, explicit uh, unhappiness that they've uh, manifest through symbolically and otherwise to North Korea. Yet at the same time, they are not willing to uh, push the full distance, fearing collapse, fearing further crisis. Uh, so they are in a position where they would like to see North Korea uh, make steps towards reform, but they are not yet at the point where they are willing to bring it to a full crisis point. And so, so they are not doing all they could do. And there are reports of a series of executions, purges of senior officials, and there are mixed opinions about regime stability. What's your view? The announcements of their demise have been made frequently over many, many decades, and uh, they've survived. And uh, so uh, I don't think that uh, we know, and it may come at a very surprising moment out of the blue, but uh, uh, I think we have to assume that it's going to be there, the regime's going to be there for a while, and, uh, uh, and plan accordingly. The six-party talks has been stalled for a long time, but considering the uh, tensions in the region and among the five parties, do you think it's still an effective tool to get North Korea to denuclearize, or do we need a new form of dialogue? Quiet talks that, are, that aren't in a kind of formal format are, are where you need to go first, but, but uh, I think for purposes of, of ratifying uh, future agreements and legitimating uh, uh, the kind of framework that might lead to serious change. The six-party talks are a format that needs to be left in place and ready for action, shall we say. Thank you, Professor, for your time today. Thank you. And in other news, South Korea's trade minister has expressed his regret about Japan's recent complaint to the World Trade Organization. Japan announced earlier this week that it would file a complaint with the World Trade Organization about Korea's import ban on Japanese marine products, which it imposed after the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. The trade ministry said Sunday that Minister Yun Sang-jik said his Japanese counterpart Yuichi Miyazawa discussed the issue on Saturday. The talks were held on the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting in Boracay, the Philippines. It was the first bilateral meeting of the two trade ministers in over two years. Now, foreigners living in Korea or Korean students studying abroad, transferring money can be quite a hassle at times, but the government is looking to cut through the red tape in the financial sector, this to make it possible to transfer funds across borders at institutions other than banks. Kwon Zua gives us the details. Cross-border wire transfers made easier and cheaper. That's the government's plan. The finance ministry announced Sunday it will try to simplify the process of sending and receiving money to and from any place in the world by relaxing or eliminating certain regulations. Under the plan, companies in the security, insurance and financial technology industries may soon be allowed to handle transfers. Currently, only banks are allowed to do so. The ministry hopes licensing the new companies will trigger a competition among them, leading to a reduction in transaction fees. Right now, a person has to pay roughly 50,000 won or 45 U.S. dollars in transaction fees for a cross-border transfer of 1 million won, as the money has to pass through at least three different banks before reaching its destination. The ministry also hopes the competition will speed up transfer times, as it currently takes around three days for transfers to clear. Industry watchers say deregulation would especially give fintech businesses a chance to fulfill their potential, as the current regulations have kept them from expanding. For example, once they are given the green light, Korea's top messenger services will be allowed to let people send money across the world via mobile applications. This will be especially helpful for the roughly 1.6 million foreigners living in Korea and the more than 200,000 Korean students studying abroad. The government has yet to decide on the transfer limits for the new channels, but said it's not going to be a lot. 
A finance ministry official said that even though regulations will be relaxed, the government will step up monitoring on financial crimes to deter people trying to misuse the new rules. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, there are many reasons to get out of the city and explore the countryside this summer. For many, eating fresh local traditional food is a big draw. Arirang's Won Jian reports on a program to help foreigners get a true taste of Korea. Five hungry foreign chefs left the big city behind. A Korean agricultural agency organized their trip to Cholabukdo province to showcase the country's traditional food culture. Over the course of the day, the chefs got to make local dishes, learn about their history, and of course, taste them. It's very herby and richy, mm -hmm. and uh, and I feel like healthy also. I I taste the tea, which is which was very good. Like. Uh, it's very similar with the, the taste of it in, in my country, something, but it's more better than that. At these countryside restaurants, 90 percent of the food comes from local farms. There's also a bit of storytelling as the restaurant staff teach diners how to eat their food while explaining the traditions behind each dish. The food that we serve reflects our philosophy. Here we only use natural ingredients to build flavor, which makes our food taste better and much more meaningful. The government first initiated the farm-style diners as a business model in 2007 to help out local farmers. There are now more than 100 locations nationwide, with 50 more planned in the next two years. And the restaurants will soon become a tourist attraction in Korea. Using the feedback from Tuesday's trip, the agricultural agency will launch tour packages to farm restaurants, hoping to attract more foreign visitors in the future. Won ji Arirang News. And turning now to the weather, it looks like things will heat up for Buddha's birthday here in Korea on Monday. The mercury is expected to rise all the way to 29 degrees Celsius in Seoul, to 33 in Daegu, and to 30 in Taejeon and Cheonju. It says dry weather advisories are set to expand to more parts of the nation. The summer conditions with temperatures of 30 plus degrees are forecast to continue through the week. And let's check on the weather conditions around the world. And we've come to the end of our newscast on this Sunday in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you're well rested and ready to tackle the new week. Good night.